Sorry, I seem to have muted the teacher. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay, so this is the second session of the first day. And in this session, we have a sutta reading from Ajahn Brahm's translation of the word of the Buddha. So he's going to do that. And after that, we're going to have an opportunity for questions and answers about the practice or about Buddhism, whatever aspect of the practice you wish to ask about. Um, so we would advise you to just listen and take in the Dhamma and then only after the Sutta class there'll be like a few minutes break for the toilet and at that time you can write in any questions, it won't take long to type something in. Um, so see if you can avoid doing that during the actual teaching and um, yeah, I think we can take it away, so I'll hand over to Ajahn. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this morning's session and uh, had some lunch. And now we have, uh, I'm starting off uh, in the middle of the Eightfold Path, just with what is called Samawayama. And many of you may know that uh, some of the words which we have uh, in, a, in translation, sometimes they're not the best translations and they can cause a lot of difficulty for people. And of course, one of the big mistranslations, which I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to get people to understand in a better way, is like samadhi. This sama samadhi is the last factor of the Eightfold Path. And samadhi is often translated as concentration which you know, to me has stopped many, many people understanding what meditation truly is and actually cultivating the path. Because concentration takes force, it takes effort, it takes struggling and striving. And that always somehow was something uh, wrong with that type of translation. Because in the deeper you go to meditation, the more struggle, the more force you give to it, the more you disturb it, the more you find that the, the meditation doesn't work. So there must be some a better translation uh, for samadhi than concentration. And of course, the answer was like stillness. When you practice meditation, and you don't just study the books, but you actually practice it, and you see other people meditating. It's one thing which really stands out, the stillness which you experience. And also, that means that to attain stillness, samawayama must be, have a different meaning. Not so struggle, not force, not holding things, but something a bit more refined. The whole of you know, Buddhism is like about kindness and stillness and gentleness. Where was that when we got to like putting forth lots of effort? And of course, that's what you know, the Buddha tried for such a long time before he was a Buddha. Six years he was struggling and <coughs> putting so much force and effort into what he was doing. And he realized that that's not the way. And still today, many people put way too much effort into what they're doing. They struggle, they strive. When you want something, that's where you put effort in. But instead of putting effort, we have this other word, which we call either you know, restraint or guarding or you know, leaving things be, letting go. And that is also an effort. And this is one of the reasons why I'm starting off with Samawayama, the sixth factor on the Eightfold Path, simply because it really makes it quite clear what meditation is and why we're doing it. So I'm now going to read out the translation. The, <coughs> the translation is I've got from Anguttara 4, verses 13 to 14. What now is Samawayama? There are these four right, summer, right, is good translation. These four right restraints, and this particular edition of the word of the Buddha, I used restraints. 
And the reason we put restraints on uh, is because of something which Ajahn Chah told me a long time ago. And it was the old simile of um, the tree, the leaf on the tree. That leaf will only move because the wind is blowing. So you've got to restrain the wind, guard it, make sure the wind doesn't do anything to disturb the leaf on the tree. And the leaf will become still all by itself naturally. It was a powerful teaching simply because it showed that this meditation is allowing this natural process of stillness to happen. And of course, you know, we all know that the first time the Buddha uh, I can't really call him the Buddha at this time. Uh, he was Bodhisattva, uh, <coughs> Gautama. The first time he had a deep meditation was as a six or seven year old boy under a tree while his father was busy just doing some ceremony. And if you ever you've seen so many ceremonies, you know that often they're very boring. I do many ceremonies in my life and I try to make them interesting. That's why you crack a few jokes so that people can understand what those ceremonies are. When they understand them, it has more meaning in their life. It's not just an empty ceremony. So anyway, that this was an empty ceremony. The person who was about to become the Buddha in a few years time, sitting under a tree, he just managed to let go and be peaceful. And when he did, he got into these deep meditations. There's no striving there. There's no struggle, there's no effort. It was almost like stopping the effort and relaxing and then see what happens. <coughs> so it gives a good idea that right restraint or right letting go or right renunciation, these are much better translations. I haven't found a perfect translation yet. Many people have suggested things, but I'd say many words for Wayama so you can understand sort of what it really means. But the best understanding of what that word means is by how the Buddha explained it. So the Buddha said, there uh, are these four right restraints, guarding, abandonment, development, and preservation. So these four right Wayamas. So first of all, the restraint of the five hindrances by guarding the senses. Now, I said the five hindrances because this is one of the whole purposes of the Eightfold Path up to number six, to be able to restrain the five hindrances. And that'll become very clear once we get into things like Satipatthana and Jhanas. The five hindrances, the five Nirvanas, are what? sort of uh, distorts wisdom and it weakens mindfulness. The five hindrances are like the big enemies of enlightenment, of insight, and they need to be understood and overcome. So restraint to the five hindrances by guarding the senses. Now, what is the restraint of guarding? When you see an object, just with your eyes, you do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. And even that English word, getting sucked in, you get drawn in by some of those features which you, know, you think of as beautiful or which uh, create um, ill will and anger. Since if you left the faculty of sight unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom when seeing. You guard the faculty of sight and you undertake the restraint of sight. So there may be some sort of enemy, some like ex-partner or some beautiful person who comes in to the retreat center. And instead of looking at them, you know, which disturbs you, you keep your eyes restrained. And one of our members years ago, she decided, this is one of the meditators in Perth, she was a Theravadan, but she wanted to go and see the Dalai Lama. And uh, many years ago, all you needed to do was to get to Dharamsala in India. And once you got there, 
made an appointment in a few days to have an uh, interview with him. But anyway, she had to wait for a few days. And so she would always get up early and go to the meditation hall in the morning. And so when they, uh, she got to the meditation hall, it was very quiet, empty. So she started to sit down and meditate. And then she, she heard somebody come in and sit next to her and start meditating. And she made the big mistake of opening her eyes and looking who it was. And that was the end of her meditation, that session, because <laughs> it was, uh, what was his name, the, the film actor. Who was the film actor? Richard Gere, yeah. Ajahn. Richard Gere, that's right, thank you, yeah. You can tell that I've had a long day <laughs> when the names start to disappear, so you have to help me out there. It was Richard Gere, it was 20 years ago when he was reasonably young. <laughs> And that was the end of her meditation, because you know, she tried to watch her breath and just let go, but she didn't restrain enough. So because of that, you can understand just how, if you want to meditate, when you see something nice or you feel that something nice is there, keep your eyes closed or keep your eyes restrained. Otherwise, the, you get sucked in by some of the characteristics or features that generate defilements. So you have to guard your senses. And it's the same with uh, not just seeing, where you guard the faculty of sight, you want to take the restraint of sight, when you hear a sound. And you have noticed the smell, having sensed the taste, having felt a, felt a bodily feeling, having cognized something in the mind. You do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. Since if you left the mind faculty unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom with the mind, you guard the mind, and you undertake the restraint of the mind. So this is all done by using your wisdom power, not your willpower. It's like you have a choice. What do you want to watch? What do you want to uh, see? And you realize that some sites they'll just disturb your meditation. Other sites, you know, will actually calm things down. So little by little, we learn the importance of calmness, peace. And so we undertake restraints of sight. So little by little, I was taught by Ajahn Chah is to keep the eyes down as much as you can when you're walking or when you're sitting in a place. So you don't go down looking for something to excite you. The pleasure of unrestraint is very short-lived. You get a bit of pleasure, a bit of a boost, but you have to pay for it afterwards. But when you don't indulge in that pleasure, you leave the mind restrained and guarded, you find that the pleasure increases. A natural pleasure, the piti sukha of restraint. This is called the restraint of guarding the senses. And it's not just seeing him as meditating, touching, it's also the mind. Because you know, people can see you, you know, if you're listening, if you're looking at the most beautiful girl in the world, or you're reading some sort of uh, uh, article or rubbish or something, they can see if you're hear you, if you're listening to some music or whatever. But your mind is no one can see what you're doing, only you. Of course, sometimes you have monks and nuns who can read your mind, so be careful. Even though you may be on the other side of the world, that's not a barrier for people who can read the mind. So you have to be careful sometimes. And it's nice in the sense that you know that I better keep my mind peaceful because otherwise an Ajahn Chah who might tell me off, as he sometimes would do. I'm sorry, but it is late in the evening for me, because I have a busy day. So I will tell you a lovely story of when Ajahn Chah read one of the disciples' minds in Thailand. And that was when I was in the back of the car. I was a, a monk at the time, and there was a two monks on either side of me. Ajahn Shah was in the passenger seat. 
and the driver was taking us all to the station to get the train down to Bangkok. And out of nowhere, Ajahn Chah turned around in the car. They didn't have seat belts on in those days. And he looked at this novice from America called Gary and said to him, you are thinking about your old girlfriend in LA. And he was. He went all red and his mouth dropped. It taught us that we shouldn't really you know, have any sensual thoughts. We're in a, a motor car with someone like Ajahn Chah. But anyway, Ajahn Chah then carried on by saying, I think I can help you. If you really miss your girlfriend back in America, please ask her to send something of hers, something personal, so you can always remember her. So when you feel lonely, you don't have to be so miserable. And I was surprised at that sort of attitude from an Ajahn Chah. I didn't know him that well. But you got to know when he said something unexpected like that, there's going to be some, some amazing explanation, some punchline, something which you will always remember for the rest of your life. And of course I did. And he said, but don't, I think the mark said, is it allowable you know, to, for her to send you a lock of her hair or a piece of a dress or something? And I just, oh, yeah, that's allowable for a monk or an office to get some, something from his ex-girlfriend or ex-wife or something. But make sure you know what to ask her to send you. And then he continued by saying something in Thai. And the translator it took such a long time to translate it because he was laughing, laughing almost hysterically with what Ajahn Shah advised him to ask his ex-girlfriend to send to him. Then send her, ask her to send a little bottle, only a small bottle, and ask her to put in that bottle some of her, uh, please excuse the English, some of her shit, some of her feces. So whenever, then you always say to her, oh, I love everything about you, my darling. I love you completely. <laughs> So ask her to send some of her shit. So whenever you, you feel lonely and you miss her, just open up the bottle <laughs> and smell. And same thing uh, for uh, any nun. If you miss any old ex-partners or whatever, ask her, him to send something like that to you. Because what it's doing, instead of just thinking or sensing, some of the most wonderful things about those people. If you have lust and you get getting sucked into these things, use something which balances your perception of beings. In other words, something which you can have an even-minded understanding of a human being. And that will actually lessen you getting sucked in to believing this person is perfect. Anyway, that's how we manage to uh, avoid being, oh yeah, here we go, avoid being uh, sucked in to not guarding our senses. We make sure that we don't look for things which create stronger hindrances. And the next of the uh, part of Samawayama, abandoning. And we call this the restraint of the five hindrances by abandoning. What is the restraint by abandoning? Here you do not maintain an arisen thought of wanting. You abandon it, let it go, renounce it, and bring it to cessation. So this is not just guarding it so these things don't arise. If they have arisen, then you find out what is the wise way to let it go, to abandon it, to renounce it. You do not indulge in a risen thought of aversion or a risen thought of harming. Whenever bad thoughts arise, you abandon them. 
let them go, renounce them and bring them to cessation. This is called a restraint by abandoning. And sometimes when we do have like bad thoughts in our mind or bad sort of uh, feelings in our mind, how does that work? How do you abandon them? You know, one of the best ways of doing that uh, is described in that wonderful simile of the anger eating monster. And the anger eating monster, I'm sure you've all heard of that before in my talks. Uh, it's from the Devaputa Samyutta, or sorry, the Yaka Samyutta. And there, sort of a, a demon, a monster appeared in this heavenly realm uh, in the Empress's palace. And all the guards said, get out of here, you don't belong. They tried to use willpower, often through aversion. Get out of here, you can't stay here. And that demon just grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and more ugly, more smelly, more offensive. And you might experience that in your meditation, when there is an unwholesome series of thoughts uh, in your mind, we try to get rid of them, you often find that those uh, bad thoughts, unskillful, unwholesome states actually get stronger and last longer because we're actually feeding them with aversion. The anger eating monster gets bigger and stronger. But in this wonderful story, adapted, of course, that um, the Empress is so wise. She says, welcome to that monster. And because she says, welcome to the monster, the monster gets smaller and everybody realizes that the solution to the problem is not giving anger, get out of fear, you bad thoughts don't belong. Instead, giving kindness, giving compassion, making peace with these things. And it surprises you that it seems counterintuitive, but it often works being kind to the bad emotions in your mind, being aware, being kind, practicing kindfulness. And that little monster, similarly, the monster gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the monster gets so small, it fades totally away. <clears throat> and that becomes how we restrain our mind uh, when um, uh, and there is a thought of wanting or uh, ill will or delusion arises in our mind, sometimes by kindness. There are also, in the Majjhimanikaya 20 Vitaka Vichara Sutta, Vitaka Santana Sutta, sorry, that when you are mindful of some object and there arises in you disturbing, troublesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion, then you should give attention to some other object that generates peaceful states of mind. Thus, disturbing thoughts are abandoned and subside. With their disappearance, your mind becomes internally settled and unified and still. And this is when we are meditating. And instead of um, looking at whatever you're experiencing in the same old way, we can actually look at it in other ways. We give attention to some other object or some other way of looking that generates peace and kindness. So often whenever there is um, any problem in your meditation, though we can just again give kindness, give letting go, give making peace. It's the way you meditate, not what you're meditating on, is sometimes the most important. And then the disappearance, your mind becomes internally steady, settled, unified, and still. And the unified and stillness there, this phrase is four terms are used very regularly. And the stillness there is always samadhan or remotiyang sometimes. It means that the mind does actually experience the deep samadhi. So you're generating peaceful mind states. What generates peace in your mind? You never generate peace through willpower and ill will. You should examine the danger in those disturbing thoughts. 
which is one of the other brilliant ways of dealing with this. You look at those thoughts, which are just the hymn says, you're just wasting time. And there was, uh, there was a, a famous monk, still alive, um, and he told me this story. He was in a monastery uh, in the south of Thailand, not in the south here, the south uh, east of Thailand. And there they would always meditate two hours every morning before arms round. And it was always very difficult for him to meditate for two hours. His mind would become very restless. And so but one morning, he told me, I swear I can't tell his name, he's still alive. One morning he told me that he was meditating and this same old story, getting sleepy, getting tired, he decided instead to have a sexual fantasy. We said the two hours went past so quickly and he thought, wow, this is weird. But anyway, when he came out afterwards, he saw the teacher was looking directly at him and he started to feel so guilty. And his teacher came up to him and he gave this wonderful little reprimand or lovely piece of advice. He said to his student, you've just been wasting your time. And it was a beautiful, he wasn't saying you're doing something wrong or you're a bad monk. He was just saying that well, you've only got a certain amount of time in your life. Don't waste it. It's important that you give attention so that you see the danger in wasting time. So all of you who are on this retreat, don't waste your time in uh, thoughts or feelings or responses, which you know are uh, unwholesome, uh, akusala, as they said, and you see the danger in them. And the more you indulge in dangerous negativity, the more it becomes stronger in you, you're feeding it. So examine the danger in those disturbing thoughts and also just to see the, the much more uh, value in the good thoughts and the peaceful thoughts. You should try to ignore those disturbing thoughts and do not give attention to them. Now to be able to avoid and not give attention to disturbing thoughts, one of the best ways of doing that is realizing that uh, you, can you can focus on something central to you. This was the old simile which I uh, developed and saw whenever I used to go on aircraft to travel to nice places like UK or anywhere in the world, that on the back seat, you always have this little screen, that, sorry, the back of the seat in front of you, there'll be a little screen on which they put the safety video on and you were compelled to look at it. And when I was looking at the safety video, the one thing I noticed more than anything else was when I first looked at it, you could see not just the screen, but you could see just the, the rim of the screen, the, the frame of it. And you could also see the upholstery of the chair in front of you. But then I noticed that the longer you uh, stared at that, um, uh, safety video, then your focus narrowed in and soon you couldn't see the upholstery in the chair, you couldn't sit in front of you, you could not see even the colour of the frame. It's like your vision, your mind just fat into the screen in front of you, just like you're watching me on your, uh, on your screen of your computers. After a while, you find you can't even see what's to the left, the right, above and below that screen. And if you really focus in, you find that you can't even see the, the edges of the screen. You don't even know what their color is. Little by little, you find it's the focusing in uh, ability of the mind. And what's on the edges, because it's not important to you, disappears and vanishes. And this is actually how focusing works. These days, we, well, if you ever use Google Maps to find out where you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to go when you go teaching somewhere, you find you zoom in. When you zoom in to the main object, you find that what's on the edges of the screen 
it eventually falls off the screen as you zoom into the center. And that's actually like what it means by saying that um, uh, you should ignore those disturbing thoughts, do not give attention to them. It means actually you're focusing on the most important part. Other things may be in your mind, but you're focusing on sort of the breath or letting go of kindness or whatever. And then the other thoughts that sort of like hovering in the background, but actually really center in to say your breath or stillness or whatever it is, you find those extraneous thoughts, they tend to disappear. You're zooming into the center because that's most important to you. And what's on the edges vanishes. So that's a very helpful way of overcoming the disturbing thoughts. Even other disturbances like noise. I've often said when pe to people who have to meditate in a noisy environment, create a bubble around you. It's an imaginary bubble. You're inside that bubble and the sounds and disturbances are outside the bubble. And just by making it a bubble, your bubble where you're inside of it, you'll find that well, what happens to me anyway, things outside of that bubble seem to get further and further away. You're zooming in and what's outside the bubble gets further and further away. Just by making a bubble, it appears to the mind, it's convincing the mind that those things outside the bubble are not important. What's inside the bubble is more important to you. And then give attention to studying the causes that created those thoughts. Why? I think I've already mentioned to you when I gave the talk this morning, like things like restlessness. Why would my mind not stay still? And of course, the main reason is because the attitude we have to our own mind. Years and years and years, I tried to control my mind. And then I decided to be kind to my mind. And when with that kindness to the mind, just looking at whatever happens in your meditation with kindness, with care, you found the attitude, the relationship I had to my own mind totally changed. We were the best of friends. And because we're the best of friends, you find that the cause that created the thoughts, the fantasies, the past, the future for you, those causes were trying to escape from a process which you didn't understand or which you didn't like, you weren't comfortable with. And after a while, those, those things vanished and disappeared. So you were comfortable. So my... These days, when I watch something like my breath, my breath and me are best of friends. So we have a good relationship, and it's the lack of a good relationship, which was the cause for my mind saying, oh, he wants me to watch the breath, no way. I've done that too often, it's boring, I get told off when I don't follow the breath. And those sorts of memories from the past got a bad reaction. So it meant that it's very hard to stay with my breath. But once I, okay, if you want to stay with your breath, fine. If you don't, that's fine. I was so kind to my mind. Now my mind doesn't just rebel anymore. I found out the causes that created those thoughts. Just an escape because of, I wasn't peaceful with my own mind. And lastly, you should clench your teeth with your tongue pressed against the roof of your mouth and beat down, constrain, and crush any disturbing troublesome thoughts. When I first read that, I thought, mm, that's a bit rough. That doesn't sound very Buddhist to me. And it's only as a last resort to stop yourself doing something really stupid. In other words, that's where you do use willpower in extreme purposes. I'm not going to do that. It's just a waste of time. Anyway, with the disappearance of the hindrances which have already arisen, which are in your mind, then with their disappearance, your mind becomes internally steady, settled, unified, and still. Now that's actually the negative part of Samawayama. If you've got bad things happening in your mind, what do you do to allow them to vanish? But they also, you notice that the other way of developing um, a nice state of mind 
is actually by so the other way of keeping out unwholesome states of mind is developing good states of mind. And here it's like if you have uh, left your house to go on a holiday or left your house to go on a residential retreat, what's the best way of safeguarding your house from bad people coming into it, like a burglars or squatters or something? And one of the best ways of avoiding bad people coming into your house is having good people stay there while you're away. And then the burglars or bad people see there's somebody there and they won't come in. So this is the next two ways of uh, Samawayama is making sure you have good qualities in your mind to begin with. And they stay there. and They don't disappear. So this is where we say the restraint of the five hindrances by developing the seven enlightenment factors or any other good factors for that matter. What is the restraint by developing? Here you develop the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, the enlightenment factor of exploring the Dhamma, of energy, of rapture, tranquility, stillness, equanimity. Everyone which is based upon seclusion, fading away in cessation, maturing in release. This is called the restraint to develop. Now each one of these things, like the factor of mindfulness, and you hear me, explained many times that mindfulness has got many different factors to it. It grows in its strength. And as it grows in its strength, the stronger it is, the more unlikely it is that bad states of mind can come into you. But that mindfulness is not sort of a fierce policeman uh, because if it's something which is fierce and aggressive and violent, that will just create unwholesome states of mind in you. It's not going to develop the good states of mind. So the real mindfulness, you can know it because it's joyful, it's peaceful, and it creates more peace. And exploring the Dhamma, a lot of times people have not the ability to explore the Dhamma because sometimes they know too much. At least they think they do. There is something which I've often said, never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. We all think we may know what exploring the Dhamma is, but I've used this so many times. And one of the main times I used this was the day, uh, the World Computer Conference in Daejeon in South Korea, where I gave the keynote address and they wonder what the heck am I doing there? I'm a monk. What do I know about computers? And so what I did, I just held up something. You know, what am I holding up right now? And I asked the people there, what is it I'm holding up? And they started saying, piece of paper, bit of square. It's uh, you know, nice for making notes. I said, but what is it? I kept on asking them and asking them and asking them until they, they ran out of things they wanted to say. All their ideas, all their descriptions, all their knowledge have been exhausted. Now I say you can start to see things. Sometimes insight is just repeating what we already know. It's giving it a name. But contemplating Dharma is seeing much deeper than that. Otherwise, everyone would be in line to be a waste of time meditating. You've got to see something you've never seen before. You see it in a way which sometimes can shock you. You see it deeper. That's what contemplating the Dharma means. You're mindful. And you allow something to stay in your mind for long enough to see something you've never seen before. That's why I prefer contemplating rather than, than thinking about the Dhamma. So even exploring the Dhamma, I think is great. Because exploring means it's not where you know what you're going to find. You go much deeper than that. And the fact of energy. Okay, you can get energy from having a good cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something. but it's the energy of the Dhamma, it's something which is far purer. And of course, when you practice mindfulness, explore the Dhamma, that energy just comes. And you're just really buzzing. When you have that energy, you have this rapture, this joy. In the morning meditation, I mentioned that joy, the pity sukha, which comes up when the mind gets really peaceful, or even when the body gets relaxed, the tranquility. This is the Kaya Pasadi and Chitta Pasadi. 
tranquility of the body, tranquility of the mind. In other words, only when you've got rapture can you get this type of tranquility. The mind has to be joyful to be calm. Otherwise, you go looking for something to disturb itself. And the stillness, and the stillness there is basically the jhanas. If you develop those sorts of things, and equanimity, that's usually the translation. These days, I'm preferring contentment. When you have these good qualities inside of you, you find the hindrances get weaker and other bad states of mind just can't come up because you have good qualities in your mind, like good friends in your house and the bad people just won't go in. And lastly, in some way, I'm the restraint of the five hindrances by maintaining positive mind states. But what is the restraint by maintaining? Here you keep in mind an arisen meditation object that generates stillness, such as recollecting the Buddha, Dhamma or Sangha, or your own acts of generosity or loving kindness or the breath or a nimitta. And sometimes people don't use enough of uh, the faith states of mind, like remembering like a Buddha, Dhamma or Sangha, or your own acts of generosity, your own kindness, there are some things which create so much inspiration. And you've done many of those things, but we're not really trained like that in the West uh, to look at our own acts as something which are inspiring. Instead, we look, you know, we just take them for granted. We make any mistakes and then all oh, we look down upon those. But that's not how you maintain positive states of mind and reduce the power of the five hindrances. And with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, but um, you all know that uh, how many times Buddhist monks like me or Buddhist nuns like uh, Venerable Chanda, how much we spend in bowing to the statues of the Buddha or something. And sometimes we don't explain what actually we're we doing when we bow to a Buddha. And a lot of times when I explain it to people, or oh, they get very inspired. And they do that, and they don't care if they're a Christian or a Muslim or anything. They're not bowing to it when they realize what they're really bowing to is not an idol. It's just a bunch of metal, a bunch of piece of wood. But then what it stands for. So I did this many years ago when I bowed to a Buddha. The first bow is to virtue. It's goodness, because virtue has meant so much to me in my life. I'm so privileged to live with virtuous people fellow monks and fellow nuns when I have the opportunity. And they're such kind, good, trustworthy people. I don't need to feel afraid. And so the first bow is to virtue and its importance in this world. The second bow is to peace. Peace in the community, like the monastery in which I live. Peace among the Anukampa Bikuni project people, as best I possibly can from a distance. Peace. In my own meditation, peace in the community, peace in the world, it's important to me. So I bow to peace, the second bow. And the third bow is to bow to compassion and kindness. Every time I see a kind act, it's, it's beautiful, it brings light to the world. So that's what I recollect on you know, bowing. Sometimes people bow to the Buddha, Dhamma, the Sangha, but I bow to virtue, peace and compassion. And the Dhamma has been so incredibly inspiring for me over the years. And the Sangha, the Bhikkhuni Sangha, as well as the Bhikkhu Sangha. Oh, just a little bit I've done. I can still do much more. I still hope to do much more to actually to create that harmony between the Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis in our world and have mutual respect and have people in the whole world just really how important it is to have Bhikkhunis themselves for others. So no one could ever feel in the Buddhist path that they are disadvantaged. So anything which creates inspiring stuff allows good states of mind to remain in you. So for me, those are the four right restraints, guarding and abandoning, developing and maintaining. These four restraints were taught by the Buddha. By these means, a diligent meditator in his very life can attain the destruction of suffering. I put it that little 
uh, poem in there. Because if you read that alone, gardening and abandoning, developing and maintaining, these four restraints were taught by the Buddha. By these means, a diligent meditator in this very life can attain the destruction of suffering. You may think, oh, that's all you really need to do. Just by the, the four samawayamas. And that's exactly how people misunderstand the four satipatthanas as well. Satipatthanas is a certain way which leads to the end of suffering. The Buddha always talked like this, because to do the four right efforts, or in this particular case, the four right restraints, or the four right guardings, the samawayama, it does mean you'll do all the other factors of the Eightfold Path before and after. So that's why, whether it's a Satipatthana, whether it's the uh, four right uh, Vayamas, the sixth factor, they will all lead you on that path to enlightenment. You may think you're focusing on this one, but you're actually doing the whole lot. So that's Ajahn Brahm on the four restraints, Samawayama. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> I hope that was okay. As you know, I was a bit tired and my hay fever was coming back a bit. So anyway, uh, now is the time for a toilet break. Is that a good idea? And then we'll start yeah. the Q&A. Great. Okay. So yeah, please take a couple of minutes. And also if you want to start typing in your questions to Q&A Derek. Poor Derek, I don't know if you get to go to the loo first, maybe. Maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Just for myself to say that hearing you, Ajahn, talk about, you know, the idea of harmony between bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and the idea of um, nobody feeling marginalized or excluded or it's just very uplifting to hear this kind of conversation because this is what we want, but it's so rarely yeah. articulated and it just means a lot actually even to put that out there and yeah. um, feel that that's important, you know, to, to so many people. So, yeah. It is. And it's sometimes embarrassing to me personally. This is not, that doesn't, uh, doesn't occur. I mean, you know that old uh, anecdote I went to visit somebody in the, one of the hospitals recently and I told the monk who was, I was with at the time and the layman who drove us there that there was a hospital in Perth where I gave a, a talk when I first came to Perth and then a gentleman, he was an elderly gentleman, came up to me afterwards and he said that I'm gay, I'm a leader of the gay community, they just called it gay in those days, in Perth. And religion has been so cool to the gay community. And he said it with such oh, pathos, with such hurt, that, that I really, I, I took that in. And I thought, why do we have to do this? It doesn't make any sense to me. I was heterosexual when I was young, but it doesn't matter. Anyone who gets marginalized or disadvantaged like that, I just can't accept it. It's not the way things should be. And if you are in a position of authority, leadership, you talk about it a lot. So you try to do as much as you can. Often you fail, but at least you keep trying and keep talking about it. Yeah, because we can never do it on our own. We have to just put the message out there. And I think just, for, you know, when people start to feel included, they also have more strength in themselves too. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So change things. Indeed. You know that I must admit that when I was a Western monk in Thailand and just one of the first Western monks over there, sometimes you just felt like an ornament. In other words, the people liked having a Western monk. There oh, we got Western monks in our monastery. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought that with that in charge with some of the other monks who you stayed with. But then again, being an ornament is like you're not the same. You're not sort of just a monk or just a monastic. And I thought that's not according to my understanding of Buddhism. That you know, when you're you're just a monastic, you're just a, a practitioner, you're a Buddhist. 
Why do we have to pull these barriers up between each other? Mm -hmm. you know, before you're old, before you're a woman or a man, before you're monastic, before you're LGBTQIA plus or anything else, you're a human being. And before even a human being, you're a being on this planet. And can we be much kinder to each other? Of course we can. I saw that there are some dogs on this retreat as well. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. What about some cats? I don't know, probably in the background somewhere. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be some cats. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> very nice. So we do have some questions coming in already. Um, okay. And I'll do them in a random kind of order, maybe building up right. to the, yeah. something profound. <laughs> so the first question is, um, my girlfriend is sick at home and my cat, there you go, my cats demand a lot of attention. So my mind is getting agitated. How can I continue to practice at home and lower my expectations? Uh, the cats can be so, so wise. Have you ever heard those stories of like cats in old people's homes and they'll go and stay with a person just then the people in the, the old people's home know that that person's going to die in a day or two. The cat knows before even the doctors know. And animals, there's some animals, some cats can be just so kind and compassionate. And, uh, so how do you deal with both of them? You have to be kind and compassionate as well. And again, it's not about your girlfriend, it's not about you, it's not about your cats. It's always about us. So you bring everybody in. And you find, yes, and you may get a bit stressed. But when you do this with so much kindness, you find a lot of that stress vanishes. You feel so amazed at yourself, how powerful kindness can be, creating energy. If you think about it too much, that is where you lose your energy and you lose your path. Don't think about it, just do it. It's quite easy. And little by little, if you have lots of kindness feeding the cats and looking after your girlfriend, bring your cats to your girlfriend and just play with them. And oh, Pet therapy really works. Sometimes your girlfriend feels much healthier being around cats or dogs or elephants. I don't know what. <laughs> Trust because animals. There's some pet therapy happening. Gina's put her dog on there. I can see a tail wagging like anything. It's very, <laughs> oh, good. very sweet. <laughs> yes, it makes you feel happier and energized. I can't see it. Oh. So anyway, because I saw that, I just thought you'd have a big smile and have lots of happiness. Mm -hmm. no, I can't see it. But anyway, it does not matter. But I uh, just, I think one day, on this retreat, if you don't mind, you can actually object to it if you wish, I attend it, is there's that wonderful book uh, called The Cat That Went to Heaven. You know that book? We've got three or four copies here in this monastery, and I was just talking about it the other day. And when I was a lay Buddhist at Wat Buddha Padipa in London, that's when it was in East Sheen, next to Richmond Park, that that was the book which was most popular in the library. You had to put your name down and wait before you could borrow it. And it's a very quiet, very simple book, but very meaningful. When I was reading it out to one of the monks, so that he had tears in his eyes. It's very emotional, very beautiful. So I thought, one of the suitors, instead of reading out what people already know, to read out something which is a little bit more deep, really deep dhamma, kindness. <laughs> <laughs> very good <laughs> okay we've got quite a lot of questions coming in so okay. um let's, let's go for a minute so let's go for it so Fabrizio is asking why is it that pure knowing without interfering is what is required in order for the experience of non-self to manifest is it this interfering that creates the me delusion of existence no it's much deeper than that it's the interfering which uh keeps the mind being agitated doesn't have enough energy and doesn't get the power to see deeply. I mean, you've, you've all heard me tell those stories, what happens when mindfulness really gets powerful? And you can just see a hump of bamboo in the UK 
We shouldn't be there. It's the most beautiful part you've ever seen. And you just watch it for hours. And you can see just uh, a piece of concrete in Thailand. And really, really honestly think you should cut it out and send it to the, the, uh, the Tate Museum of Trafalgar Square. Because it's so beautiful. Everything you see when you have strong mindfulness is incredible. It's not just pure knowing. It's actually just knowing so powerfully when the five hindrances are gone. You get really powered up by these jhanas, five hindrances are going, and you can see, you can feel, you can hear for the first time. And that's actually when you get so powerful, you can see some things like non-self. There's nothing there. It's empty. No one there. That's scary for many people. <sighs> when you've got a powerful mind, it's liberating. At last, you're free. So that's what you need. Pure knowing, because most of the time, we always think we're pure. <laughs> There's a lot of defilements in there. A lot of distortions of the perceptions. Mm. Mm. So, Ajahn, just to paraphrase, I guess what you're saying is that the interfering part of the mind that gets involved in the meditation is kind of more of a symptom of the self rather than the cause of yeah. it. And the real yeah. cause is the delusion for which we have yeah. to... Undermine those yeah. five hindrances. Indeed, yeah. I agree. Okay. <laughs> so Pat's asking, how can I prevent sleepiness in meditation? Okay, by going to bed more often. <laughs> in other words, a lot of people are sleepy simply because you didn't sleep enough last night or you, you're sleep deprived. So if I tell people the first days of retreat, just don't be afraid of taking a nap if you feel sleepy. And you'll find that's being kind to your mind. And if it really was that you were sleepy, you'll fall asleep very quickly. And you get up, no guilt, no force, however long you want to sleep, you're looking after your body. And after a while, the happiness and mindfulness just increases. You don't overcome sloth and torpor or sleepiness by force, by willpower. That actually just deprives your mind of energy. You haven't got much anyway, so you waste it, you're struggling. And again, I used to do that for so many years, fight my sleepiness. And for those of you who don't know the story, I haven't got a box of matches here. You put a box of matches on your head but you take the cover off, so it's just a tray of the matches, full of matches. And then you know that you were sleepy when your head drooped because the matches will fall off your head and make a noise. And I thought that was a really brilliant way of overcoming sloth and torpor. And it worked, only just a few days. And whenever I'd meditate at three o'clock in the morning, the, the matchbox wouldn't fall off. And then one of the other monks took me aside and said, the reason why the matchbox doesn't fall off it's because when you're nodding, falling asleep, instead of usually going like this, you're going like this. Your head was, was keeping the top still, but you're still being sleepy. And then for me, how sleepiness disappeared was learning how to be so mindful and using things like even inspiration. All the wonderful things you've done incredible, powerful stuff which you've done. Look, uh, Aya Chanda, you've six years you've been in England trying to get this thing going. It hasn't really got as well. It has got going. See all the people who uh, are around you. It needs a boost, that's for sure. But you inspire yourself. What on earth have you done over this last six years? Incredible sacrifice of giving up and letting go. And then you start to inspire yourself. You start, yes, it's working already. <laughs> you start to get straight <laughs> and you're not sleepy anymore. I don't know why people don't do that more often. Recognize all the goodness and giving you've done, all the amazing stuff which you've, you've achieved. You don't think of it as achievements, you've been a great example. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah, yeah, good.
Okay, so Remy's asking, where does the courage to let go come from? Ah, for, for the pursuit of happiness. Because a lot of times, you know, just all the stuff you have, you, know, you don't really need it. And it's wonderful when you haven't got it. Hey, free of us. Freedom is happiness. And letting go is what you have to do to be free. Yeah. And the whole retreat is going to cover that in more depth. So there'll be lots of ways and means. Okay. Yep. So um, somebody's wondering if they've got the right word of the buddha and i can't say now we sent you i think the most updated one mm. oh yeah i don't no. think 2018 is the most updated one so i think i think the yeah. one we sent you in the email should be more recent than that i hope it's good enough please remember in life there's no <laughs> such thing as perfection but it's close enough and good enough so that's one of the reasons why it's always a work in action that's one of the reasons why I haven't printed it yet, not made an official copy, simply because it's always work in progress. Very good. And also, could you announce the page numbers when you're reading? Okay. Through? Yeah. Okay. That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Jane's saying, when meditating and sitting still, I get a slight pain in a muscle under my shoulder. I get it anytime I sit for a long time, including when I work and drive. Have you any advice about how to create the environment for sitting longer? Do I just put up with the feeling? Do I stop and move and stretch? Do I keep trying to find a sitting position that doesn't hurt? Do I lie down on my back? This doesn't hurt. Yeah, sure. If you need to lie down on your back, that's fine. But if often you fall asleep when you do that. So if you do lie down on your back, lie down in a position you don't normally fall asleep. Number two, if you're driving a car, please don't lie down in the front seat of the car. <laughs> but no, seriously, that when you start meditating, just relax more. You know where that area is. And so focus on the area at the beginning and give it as much loving kindness as you possibly can generate. Even if you can reach it when you're meditating, just give it a big, bit of a massage. Look how care for you, this part of the body. So you don't need to feel so, so painful. And when you care for your body, you find it just usually responds with uh, some peace and happiness. Number two is if it happens to you in the, the middle of the meditation, if you have enough peace, stillness, and your mindfulness is strong, sometimes you can just look at that little irritation and you can zap it. Now, in other words, you look at the parts of the body and you can relax it just so deeply because now you have powerful mindfulness. You just look at it and expand everything. Just go right into it. But imagine just beautiful light coming into your body, you know, from your mind and into that part of your, your body and just relax it to the max. And it really gets so peaceful. And quite frankly, there's nothing which I've ever experienced you can't do that with. That you can actually just relax incredible sort of sicknesses and pains and stuff and they just go away. Can be done. So, and the second, the third part is when you get into really deep meditations, as many people, it's not just happens to me, it happens to everybody. Deep meditations, when you meditate for a few hours, when you come out afterwards, the first time I did a very deep meditation, I thought, oh, crikey, I'm going to be in trouble now. Because, you know, 40 minutes and you get some sore legs. But then, you know, for a couple of hours, and there's no soreness anyway. You just feel great. You feel just there's no, no um, tension anywhere. And things which were there before, the aches and pains are just all gone. The healing power of meditation is brilliant. I don't know how it works. But certainly, you may have an ache in your back. If you get into a nice deep meditation, you, know, you sort of like zoom in. So that pain is on the outside. Someone goes further and further away from you. The pain hasn't sort of uh, just zapped and gone away, but you just don't pay attention to it. You go deep inside. When you come out, there's no pain there at all. So that's one way of doing it. But if it really is disturbing, there's nothing wrong in deep in meditation 
is actually just to gently um, adjust the body. That's fine because yes, you you go backwards a little bit in your meditation progress, but you soon get back to the same place you were before, but without the pain, and you can go much deeper. Okay. There's another question on pain. It's very similar, but um, someone's yeah. saying that uh, whenever they meditate for 30 minutes, the legs always start to hurt. They don't know what to do, whether to carry on or change position. Change so, position. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And after a while, you find you can meditate longer and longer. A lot of times, that is the fear coming up. We're always going to hurt soon. It's about half an hour. So you change posture. When you're not afraid of meditating, then you can meditate much longer mm. without pain. Simple psychology. And sometimes we can sit on chairs as well, right? Because normally the legs hurt chairs. when you're cross-legged, but not when you're on a chair. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah certainly. Okay. So Leah's asking, she'd like some advice on how to fine tune treating negative emotions with kindness. For example, with anger, when I try to allow the anger, I can fall into indulging it by giving it space. Can you give some practical advice or even a technique on how to be kind to negative feelings? Yeah, poor negative feelings, nobody likes them. And so I consider the negative feelings to be just, uh, they're just like uh, bikunis in some monasteries where people don't like them. And why? These are real beings, so be kind to them, let them be. They're not as bad as people think. No, but quite <laughs> seriously, that. How to be kind to the negative feelings. Somehow or other, they're going to teach you a great lesson. But look at them as teachers. When I was complaining to Ajahn Chah about the mosquitoes in Thailand, which were horrendous, he said, call them Ajahn Mosquito. They're your teachers. You'll learn so much from them. One of the things I saw with anger is, again, that I didn't realize just those people who were doing this so-called bad things and being very angry at them. But my anger was also a terrible thing. And I was actually contributing so to the problem. You have all these wonderful similes, like anger is like, you, know, you see something or somebody or some situation which you, know, you think is wrong, and you pick up these hot coals. In the old days, they have, please excuse me, the old coal fires. You pick up a hot piece of... Uh, metal or something, you throw it at someone, try to hurt them. Often you miss, but you always hurt yourself. Anger is always self-destructive. It very rarely hurts anybody else. You think it does, but it doesn't. And uh, in today's world, if you get angry at somebody, you may have a very good point and something which needs to be pointed out to people. But all people ever see is your anger. They don't actually see what you're really talking about and they dismiss you. So it's counterproductive. So after a while, you see that anger is not valuable in today's world. Even when you're in a position of authority, you have to tell somebody off. Always use the, the sandwich method. If you have to tell you know, your husband off or something because he's misbehaved or whatever, be kind to him first. If you just get angry at him, he doesn't listen. <laughs> of course, no one listens to anger. They just see anger. If you're kind to him, so sort of praise him and opens their ears up to hearing more. And then you can actually say what well, the problem is, not with anger. It's a problem for all of us who want to solve it. Otherwise, you just become like one of the terrorists in the world, blowing up people to prove your point or to get rid of the pests in our world, wherever they are. So if you have anger in your, in your uh, mind, just be kinder to people. One of the other ways of overcoming anger, I've realized that if I got angry at somebody, it was like I had a, a, a court case against them, just like in a court of law. And so they were, they were accused of some bad thought or bad speech towards me or towards somebody I cared for. And in the court case, I noticed I'd only ever have the prosecutor, and I'd be the prosecutor, thinking all the bad things they've done. And I wouldn't allow the defense attorney to say anything. And I'd also be the judge. Didn't need to waste time listening to the defense. Banging the gavel, guilty. And once I had the 
uh, the judgment, the verdict of guilty, I felt free to be angry at them. They deserved it. And I realized a great way of overcoming that misuse uh, you know, of judging is actually to always have a defense. If somebody did something wrong, I try and listen, why did they do that? And try and find some extenuating circumstances why they did it, or maybe I misunderstood what they were doing. Try and find out some really smart defense to get them off the verdict of guilty. So I couldn't be angry at anybody. Why did they do that? There's, like this one monk years ago got angry at me for washing his bowl in the wrong way. And then and I realized he actually suffered from migraines, chronic migraines, and I thought, oh, that's the reason why he got angry. So I didn't need to get angry back. You find some idea, some means to, to realize a person is just responding the best they possibly can. So we've got lots of questions. The next one's about pets. Uh, when your oh, pet yes. is really sick and there's no way it'll get better, according to Buddhism, can we decide for euthanasia even if it's against the precepts? No, you can't make decisions like that. You have no right to decide your dog must die or your cat must die. There's a much better alternative to that. The alternative is, say you've got a cat who's very sick, ask the cat what it wants to do. This is not a joke, it's a simple message and it's so powerfully true for Buddhists. This lady, Judy, her name was, she had a dog, she looked after it so well and it was Actually, it was the same lady who sat next to Richard Kia, believe it or not. But she had a, a cat, so a dog, took it to the vet, had cancer. Dog said, got to put it down. You've got to sort of euthanize it. But she followed my teachings and she said, I'll just spend a few minutes with my dog, first of all. And she asked the dog, do you want to die? Do you want to have an injection which will euthanize you? That was her dog. She loved it so much looked into its eyes and she got the very clear message back. The dog said, no, I don't want to die yet. This is just how you feel. You love somebody you know, and you, you're mindful enough to really listen. And she told the vet, said, no, I'm taking you home. And the vet scolded her. You stupid Buddhist, you say you're compassionate, you're not. But she took it home. Six months later, <laughs> She took the dog back to the vet. It had survived. The cancer had gone. And the vet looked at it and said, well, I don't know what you've been doing, but you Buddhists are very compassionate or wise. <laughs> the dog or the cat will know. And if you look in the dog's eyes or the cat's eyes and you get the answer, it's suffering too much. It doesn't want to live anymore. Then you convey your pet's decision to the vet. You're not choosing for it. You're finding out what your pet wants to do. And then you tell the vet what it needs. If they hear very clearly from your cat, it's really suffering too much. It wants to, to now die. It becomes voluntary euthanasia. The animal decides. Your grandma decides. So whoever it is uh, has the voluntary euthanasia. You don't have the right to make that decision for anybody. So the next ones are meditation questions and they're one yeah. about ordination. So mm. we've got about four or five more. Um, I've never meditated for more than 45 or 50 minutes. I'm afraid that my focus during meditation is not good yet enough to be able to try for longer. Is there some advice considering the question when one is ready for longer meditation? No, it's, it just happens. It's nothing to do with you trying. You don't do it. You get out of the way. You let it happen. And that's all the time. We've had all this, oh, just one of the, <laughs> the last meditation retreat I taught here. There's one of the ladies there. She's been looking after the Buddhist society in many, many different ways. And she maybe do 50 minutes, an hour or something at most. And for the first time, she did a, almost a three-hour meditation. And 
You never ask her, are you ready to do this? It just happens. And you sit down and becomes very still, very peaceful, very joyful, and you're just having the time of your life. Sorry, the time of your many lives. <laughs> so you never know if you're ready or not, you just do it. And if it happens, great. Keep it natural. Uh, the next one says, when I was meditating, I felt that my body was heavier rather than lighter as I was more aware of my body. Is this common and part of the process? Yes, it's common and part of the process. Well done. Carry on. Because your body just feels heavy. It's exactly the same weight, but it just feels because your mindfulness is increasing. And after a while, just you find that it would be heavy, but not unpleasantly heavy, and then it will disappear. And you go deep inside. Great. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> so someone else says, I'm interested in the relationship between PT, that's rapture, and pasadi, which is tranquility, which uh, you mentioned in your talk. Yeah. I've noticed when my meditation goes calm that tranquility seems to arise along with delight. It can seem like a paradox as PT can seem rather exciting or uplifting. Please, can you say something about this? Why is Pasadi not a jhana factor? Oh, this is another sort of part of the question. Yeah. Why is Pasadi not a jhana factor? I sort of feel it should be, not that I've experienced yeah. jhana. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the tranquility, the peace, it strengthens your mindfulness. Because imagine just you have a mobile phone and it's always going on a charger, but when you're not sort of using it, it's calm, it's turned off. It actually strengthens its energy. And even the picture becomes more beautiful. The sound becomes clearer. That's what happens with the mind. When you have more stillness, everything increases in its clarity and its power. And after a while, that's where you get the joy from. The more calm you are, the more happy you are. Yes, there is some happinesses which are they, they feed on energy. They, they feed, they, they eat up your energy. There are some stillnesses which just create more energy. Some of the best energies which all new people have in their lives is when they're just sitting by a lake somewhere and just, just watching just the ducks swim around. They're not doing anything. Or they see beautiful parts of nature or on a mountaintop or in places like Perth when there's a full moon. And go outside and just watch it. And it's so quiet, no one disturbs you. That passati, that tranquility gives you lots of energy. But anyway, the, the connection becomes quite clear. The joy, the happiness comes from the mindfulness. It's a mind based joy. That's why, if you look at the Anapanasati suit, which we'll read out later on, you see this is called from the, the Achitta Sankara, it comes from the, the mind. And that's one of the reasons why that comes of bamboo in Cambridge. They're not beautiful at all, but they appear incredibly exquisite. And your mindfulness is really strong. And number two, why isn't it a jhana factor? It, <coughs> it creates some of the jhana factors. The jhana factor is the stillness, it causes it. But so inside the jhana, it's much more still than ordinary pasadi. Sadi is stillness, but imagine that stillness getting stronger and deeper so nothing moves. And the happiness gets stronger and stronger, so you have a huge amount of happiness. The biggest bliss states in your life. But it's also, it's just so still. Nothing moves. You've just got joy and happiness. So those are the drama factors. I don't even look at jhana factors as factors. People analyze things way too much. When you get into those states, the best part of the jhana factors is the five senses are not there for you anymore. So you're in the sixth sense alone, you can't hear anything, can't think, perfectly aware for long periods of time, very, very still, very delightful. Okay. So someone's asking, do transgender and intersex people have an opportun opportunity to ordain too? Yeah, why not? It's, it's difficult to find a monastery which has the courage to have that happen. And we haven't done it here yet. 
But it's basically, can you live a monastic life? And if you can live a monastic life, in other words, you can lessen the, uh, the activities which come from sensuality. You can lessen the speech which comes from sensuality. You can just be, just be like a monk or a nun. Why not? Now, honestly, the, I was told when I was uh, a monk that this was in Thailand, they said, uh, even gay people cannot become monks. And it was a little bit rebellious. Why? Now, he found a loophole in the Vinaya. And it was basically was saying that if you can live as a monk, then why not? In other words, if you can give up all of your uh, sensuality and just be like any other monk or any other nun, why not? So it depends if uh, one is transgender, intersex or whatever, where do you actually belong? Where do you feel comfortable? Where do other people feel comfortable with you? So basically there's no prohibition there. It's where people feel comfortable. Okay, that's good news. Uh, okay, last question is, when meditating, how can I deal with the always talking mind? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that. Shut up. <laughs> always talking mind. A lot of times uh, when you're talking back to the world, how can you listen to the world? Now, the world is always teaching you something. One of the best ways of doing that, go to a beautiful part of nature. Okay, it's, it's, it's November now, oh, sorry, December in places like UK. It's not a time where people go out talk. Yes, they do. Because I remember just one of my wonderful experiences when I first went to uh, England as a monk and I was staying in Chitta's monastery, Chitta Uweka, and but because I was a visitor, you had no duties to do. Yay. So I remember just going out one morning. It was like minus 26 degrees or something. I forget exact number. But I remember seeing, and those people in UK remember this newspaper, the Daily Mirror. The front page the next day was, even the beer froze. <laughs> it, said, but it was really cold. Snow everywhere. And all the other monks were inside, and I decided to put as many sort of jackets and hats on as I possibly could and just go outside for a walk in the forest. It's freezing. It was a wonderful thing to do because in there, nothing was moving. There was no sound of any aircraft. No cars were on the road because the roads were all blocked with snow. All the animals were hibernating. No human beings were out. There was no sign of even bicycles on the roads. It was incredibly quiet. And every time which I stopped crunching the snow under my boots, it was, I just really listened to the silence. And that was gorgeous. So I couldn't talk. There's too much beauty happening in nature. Or if you don't like going out in such ridiculously cold weather, that sometimes you go and listen to some very fine music. Hello. Listen to some, oh, I used to like Vivaldi. But any, no, not Vivaldi, Monteverdi. It's my favorite composers when I was a lay person. Listen to some fine music. And you'll find you're not talking when you listen to music. Because if you talk, you miss so much. See nature, you miss so much if you talk. When you're meditating, if you're talking, you're missing the silence, the beauty of it. So little by little, you find silence is golden. You hear so much. You understand so much. I tell this even to, to school children doing their, their studies. When you're listening to some teacher teach you something, please be quiet. If you're silent when you're listening, you find you totally listen. You can remember so much of what was said. It's not that you've got a, a special memory, it's just you know how to listen. So that's why we can listen with no effort, no talking. We can understand so much more. 
you want to become wise, don't go reading the books. Listen to the nature. Listen to yourself. Listen to how you work. Just like that. Silence. There it is again. Beautiful. And sometimes that yeah, it's a monk, you live in quiet places. And sometimes it's all the dumber you need. Just go out into the forest and nothing moves. In Australia, I mean it's a incredibly silent place. It's so far away, you know, from the from the villages, from the uh, even the city. And we don't have like cicadas and other things in rainforests, which create lots of noise. So at night time, the wind is blowing this evening, but in most night times, when it's really no wind, there's hardly anything you can listen to. It's so silent. One of the most silent places I've ever lived in. So that just ooh, really gets you as a monk. It's like this is home, not the place, but the silence. So I love silence. Any other questions there? Only it's all silent. <laughs> Derek says there are two, but I think we're out of time and I don't see any more here. So I think we should stop now because questions can come to me in the evening and also to our gentleman. Okay. So yeah. to keep things on time, because now is our rest time and also personal practice time. So I wondered, Ajahn, if you'd like to just say a few words about walking meditation. Oh, yeah. Just you all know how to walk. But when you're walking, don't think. Don't have a conversation. So a lot of times when we do walking meditation, there's I put my eyes down on the ground, usually a body length in front of me, you know, two meters or 1.8 meters, or just don't need to get the tape measure, just roughly. So it keeps you feeling safe. Any meditation is important to have that safety. So you know that you're not going to bump into something or step on something. So keep it two meters in front of you. So you don't look to the left or to the right. You put your hands in a comfortable position, doesn't matter how. And then you feel your legs move. All of you who are watching me on the screen right now, without looking, can you lift your left leg up? Can you feel what happened? Now put your left leg back down again. Can you feel it? Now lift your right leg up, but more slowly. Now put it down again, slowly. You're becoming mindful of the feeling of just moving your legs. You don't, you've done that so many times, you don't have to make it special. Now when you do walking meditation, you can feel your legs as they're moving. You're not looking at them, you're looking two meters in front of you in view, not looking to the left or the right, you feel these things. And they become really amazing. How many, any of you have been a dancer or if you've been unfortunate enough to have a stroke or an injury and you have to learn how to walk again as an adult, just notice how many muscles have to move in the right order, in the right way for you to just walk one step. You got used to it now, so you're not noticing very much. But little by little, as you're walking, you find you notice all of the different sensations. So I used to walk in this monastery in Thailand, in Bangkok, and there was so much going on, I'd notice which part of my left foot moves above the ground, first of all, when I start to walk. What is the last part of my left foot to leave the ground as I lift it up? Does it go straight up? It didn't, never did. It went at a, a curve and then it went, for, so it went forward in a curve and then it went down. What was the first part of my left foot which, which uh, struck the ground? And I'd notice all these different movements in my feet and the space between the left foot moving and the right foot moving. And it got so amazingly um, still, so much going on there. I didn't need to look at anything else. I couldn't think because it was just, it was amazing. And you can get some very beautiful states of mind that way. 
very peaceful, very wonderful. And it supports the sitting meditation. You learn how to be still. You don't need to think or to describe things. It's just too much going on. It's just one step. I love you to love those walking meditations. Half an hour after go about, probably about 15 meters. And then turn around half an hour to go back again. That was my hour's walking meditation. You didn't get much exercise out of it, I must admit. It was just too slow and too much fun. I really enjoyed it. So you can try that when you're in your home. You don't need a big place to do walking meditation, which is why you can just stand up where you are, get yourself comfortable, walk slowly to see how much is going on in your feet as you're walking. And it's a great way of meditating. Great. So I think uh, that's the end of this session. And it's probably time for Ajahn to take this. And maybe yeah. for us oh. as well. So Yeah. One of the nice things about being old, I had my 70th birthday <laughs> in August. I've got a good excuse for going to bed. Well, I don't have a good excuse for getting up early in the morning. I was up at three o'clock this morning. Oh. I just run my mug. I just get up early. I can't stop it. <laughs> So if I was a bit sleepy this evening, it's because I started at three. I'll try my best. I promise to stay in bed until four <laughs> in the morning. For me, that's a sleep in. Honestly, I'm not joking. Yeah. But anyway. So anyway, I wish your happiness and good meditation, lots of stillness. And especially for Ayachanda, who's organizing all of this and part of the bunch of the work. I just speak. I'm used to that. So it's no effort for me, really. So anyway, <laughs> may, you all, may you all have a beautiful time. And I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow at, uh, oh, yeah, so it's one o'clock in the afternoon. One thirty in the afternoon. Time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll see you just uh, after having a nice rest. Good night, everybody. Good night, <laughs> Ajahn. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs> well, have a nice <laughs> meditate. Okay. See ya. Yes. 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 Good night. Bye. -bye. <laughs> so yeah maybe maybe your sleepy vibes can travel to us and especially for those who are tired we can actually have a little yeah. rest now and uh, yeah, you must, yeah must just to. really enjoy the day you know just enjoy yeah. the space and the time for yourself and there is one opportunity to sit together again silently at 5 15 but please if you want to join that silent sitting please come at five because matthias has very kindly offered to open the room and to host it but Matthias is also on retreat so he'd like to start the meditation at 5 15 and if you're later then you might not get let in okay so that's just another little uh, optional session for those who feel that it would be beneficial to meditate in a group okay and otherwise I'll see you in the evening yeah, take bye. care bye everyone bye Ajahn <laughs>